Uh, hi, well, welcome once again to this uh, uh, on news clip. Actually, as you know, we are running a series on uh, the the Delhi Master Plan, Plan 2041, and uh, we have tried to traverse the history of the Master Plan right from 1961. And we've spoken about the exclusivity of the plan. We've also spoken about how I mean, what what does it speak about urban housing? Uh, what are the gaps, uh, the blanks, and what actually needs to be done. But one aspect which was very pivotal in all these discussions was that actually there's hardly been any people's engagement. Actually, the people have been completely minus, and they're already alienated from the process of urban planning, urban design. But, you know, uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, in this process also, we've had just four webinars that were held by the GTA and the NIUA. So uh, the, the whole point of running the series is also that to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, work as, an, as a catalyst, you know, and we are very, uh, very happy that we have Sonal Shah who runs an organization called Urban Catalysts. Uh, yeah, so welcome uh, Sonal and uh, Sonal who's an urban planner, designer, but works on mobility. Yeah. So, so we can understand how, how and what we are, uh, what we are witnessing. Uh, so welcome, uh, uh, Sonal. And uh, uh, as you know, I mean, you've gone through the the, the master plan of uh, the the draft, in fact, because uh, it will be finalized soon. So what is it that is there in store for urban mobility? Though it speaks lots of uh, TODs and all. Uh, and where are the gaps? I and mean, that's what we've been asking everyone. Uh, what should have been the, the the concern of of that should have been addressed. Yeah. So what do you? Thank you, Jitendra, and uh, very happy to be here uh, today. Um, so what I'll do is I will go through, if you will, the mode hierarchy, starting from our most vulnerable users, which are pedestrians and cyclists, then go on to uh, understanding the master plan through the lens of public transport, that is bus space, public transport, metro rail system, and paratransit. Paratransit is uh, your auto rickshaws, shared auto rickshaws, e rickshaws, Grameen Sevas, so on and so forth. Then we will come to transit oriented development. Um, what I'll do also, um, while we talk about each of these, I will use two themes that will cut across them. One is data, and the second is gender, right? Because this is something that we also uh, uh, work on. So let's start with walking and cycling, or as we understand, non-motorized transport. So what is the data saying? First, uh, you know, 42% of um, residents of, of all trips in Delhi are on by walking and cycling. Cycling is unfortunately only 7%. But 35% are uh, pedestrians. There is some good, there is some good progress, or if I may, uh, some provisions in uh, the master plan. They are talking about creating active travel schemes for um, all roads 24 meter, uh, sorry, th I think 30 meters and above. So that's a good thing. The uh, they have also in Annex 7. Uh, provided street design guidelines, right? Uh, they're good. They focus on road safety, on, on thinking about footpaths that accommodate walking space and multi-utility zones, which is good because it provides space for your bus stops, for street vending, and a lot of informal activity. So those are the good things. However, let's take a step back and also see what are the other things that need to be improved. One is that they say, Concerned agencies will prepare these active travel schemes. Now, this is this is concerning. Why? There are more than 12 road owning agencies in Delhi. So who will make these uh, schemes, right? And therefore, given that we have UTPEC within DDA, they, they should be making first a city level plan, right? We need a city level cycle network plan for all roads 18 meters and above. Because, and this should be published as part of one of the maps of the master plan. We can, you know, we very clearly see we have only one map in the proposals, which is the land use plan. But if you look at the master plan, for example, of Bombay, they have so many maps that give you a very, that give you some idea of what is the city level infrastructure that the city wants to create. So DDA should be creating a city level active uh, uh, cycle, uh, active 
network plan focusing on cycle tracks and not cycle lanes. I'm distinguishing between the two. Yeah. The second piece is that we also need to think about, given the, the serious issue of road safety in the city, that all nodes within 500 meters of high pedestrian footfalls, what are those? Your mass transit stations, metro rail stations, your ISBTs, your bus terminals, and also around universities, colleges, and schools should be traffic count so that they're safe and traffic safe for pedestrians and vulnerable road users. And how do you make them, how do you traffic calm them? Not through a board, right? Because we know that unfortunately these are not enforced, but by design. And these speeds should not uh, exceed more than 20 kilometers per hour. These need to be published by DD as part of their current master plan, yeah? The third piece I'm going to say is, we have Annex 7, we have UTPEX Street Design Guidelines. Please update, I mean, UTPEX Street Design Guidelines are good. Please update new guidelines that have been created uh, as Annex 7 as part of UTPEX Street Design Guidelines, yeah? And, uh, and we need a dedicated section on women's safety and security. Actually, I did my fellowship on urban mobility from Leipzig. Nice. So, yeah, and it's one of the highly pedestrianized and, uh, you know, very cycle friendly city where I think uh, almost 28% commute on bicycle. And of course, uh, I think they definitely cross our, our, our figures. The point is actually there, the city government does all this. Why are you saying so much for the DDA to do it? I mean, why, why don't you bring in, uh, you know, because there are multiple layers of governance in Delhi. So why are you not saying the Delhi government? I mean, for me, the chief minister of Delhi is like a metropolitan mayor. Okay, so yeah, yeah, or 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 why not the municipal corporations? So you know, actually, they are the ones who who uh, should do who should be doing this work. Okay, DDA lays a larger framework that look. So I mean, the 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 executive part. I mean, the execution. Why don't you, why don't you just come to that? Yeah. Yeah, so let me distinguish, Dipendra. Uh, I'm talking about the planning uh, so that it becomes part of the master plan, which is a statutory document, which means that PWD, which owns uh, mostly all roads 80 meters and above, right? I think that's about 1,300 square kilometers or thereabouts. Then PWD implements. I'm not saying they don't, but the planning at the city level needs to be done by DDA so that we have a network, right? The execution and the detailed design needs to be done by PWD, which in any case will have to be approved by UTP. I hope I clarify that. Uh, so now I'll come to integrated public transport. And unfortunately, a lot uh, is left desired in, in both the baseline studies and in the master plan. One, and I'm, I'm a little, I was unfortunately is the serious lack of data, right? I think DDA needs to get data on public transport from the Delhi Transport Department. I mean, do you have access to this data? They are referring to secondary research in, um, in their baseline studies, which is okay, but you can supplement it with the, the actual user data that you can get from other government agencies. So I think this is, this is a little unfortunate. Now, what are we saying? Uh, what are they saying in the baseline studies? They are saying uh, that the cost of traveling in an AC bus and uh, the metro is, uh, is, uh, is comparable. And over a period of time, we will see people using shift to the metro because it's more comfortable and it's more convenient. The, uh, the second thing is they also say that the predominant modes of access to buses in Delhi is by rickshaws, different modes, e-rickshaws, auto rickshaws, shared auto rickshaws, and so on. We have numbers. Now, I think this is absolutely incorrect. Um, there's enough data to show that first, majority of the first and last mile trips to buses are by walking. So one study says 87%, right? So because there are 3,200 bus stops in Delhi compared to 500 metro rail stations, I mean, both existing and proposed, right? The, a bus network has better connectivity 
right? Um, and therefore, we see that most of the first and last mile trips are by walking. And this is critical. Why? So this is what we did. Uh, we looked at non-AC bus, AC bus, phase one metro stations, phase two metro stations. And we began to calculate the cost of the average trip in Delhi, which the baseline study says is 10.9 kilometers, okay? So we said, okay, let me test the, this, this argument made in the master plan. The baseline study also says that the average income, the per capita income in Delhi is about three lakhs um, annually, which comes to roughly 25,260 rupees, okay? So we have cost of one trip per day, the cost of that trip in a month, and we use different income ranges. Someone who earns 5,000, someone who earns 10,000, someone who earns 20, someone who earns 25,000, which is the average income uh, that they claim, and someone who earns 30,000. Okay. Let's see what we found. And I mean, I'm happy to share this table with you as well. What we found is, is that even for a person who is earning 25,260 rupees a day, uh, per month, the metro rail system uh, is, is unaffordable if you consider first and last mile by paratransit. Now, how do you assess affordability? There are one metric is that you do not spend more than 10% of your income, right, on transport. I, what did we find? That if someone had to use phase one metro rail stations and, and uh, phase two metro rail stations, they would end up spending anywhere between 15 to 17% of their income uh, on travel. And this is the average quote unquote income person. If I'm earning, let's say 10,000 rupees per month, okay? If I had to use the, the metro uh, rail system, and I'm just going to refer to my data. So let's say if I'm earning 10,000, I will end up spending um, 26 to 42% of my income if I have to use the metro rail system, right? So, so let's like take a step back and, and really assess that, um, are we going to see the shift that we are that uh, that is being proposed in the master plan. The what we have seen is over um, in, in two thousand seven the average trip length by buses increased uh, from ten kilometers to fourteen kilometers. Right in um, I think two thousand eighteen or so. Why is that? Right. What does that have to do with, for example, the fare hikes in the metro system in 2017? So I think we'll have to be very, very mindful when we are comparing, right, um, uh, bus based transport and metro rail transport, right? Because this is not going to be affordable to a large section of uh, workers in the informal economy. If I may, uh, we did a research and I'm just going to uh, present this argument and happy to hear your thoughts. We did uh, research just um, on the impact of COVID-19 on women informal workers. Um, the average, and we partnered um, with the Self-Employed Women's Association for some part of our study. So it included quantitative 800 surveys in Delhi along with qualitative surveys. The average monthly income of um, informal women workers was 6,000 rupees a month. They are not going to be able to use the metro rail system at all, right? So, so let's just kind of, you know, just assess uh, not only the fare of the main mode, but the first and the last mile. Um, Dikinder, should I just move into what are recommendations are before we have this conversation? Yes, uh, no, no, I, I think Sonal, it's very interesting that you're pointing out. And actually, mm -hmm. uh, this also leads to a very simple uh, statement that uh, the, the, the master plan is missing this very important essential aspect of, uh, of mobility. And, uh, you know, I'm mean, then, then for whom is, is, is this master plan? Uh, and, and that's the argument what Katie and all have been 
uh, I mean, pushing forward. It's more for capital intensive technologies, and these are not sustainable. So I think the end point when we when we wind up the discussion, I mean, so I mean, we must bring in this whole concept of sustainability, you know, and these, I mean, these recommendations, I mean, this what you have brought in through your quantitative and qualitative data, I mean, very amply suggests that actually what what is happening is uh, is something that that doesn't uh, help a larger section of, of, of the, yeah I think, I think yeah the third point that you want to make yeah sure let me just clarify the kinder i'm not saying that the metro rail system is bad by no means yeah i'm just saying that recognize the importance of bus based transport in our cities. Um, and I'm also going to draw a little bit uh, from international examples. Cities like Hong Kong, very rail-based rail -based systems, Hong Kong. No, I, I'll, I'll share, share the Leipzig example also, you know, because sure, they have please. the metro and the rail, but you know, the kind of subsidy, it's free, can you believe that? It's, but then they tax your large guzzlers on the road. You know, that's the kind of cross subsidization. I mean, are we prepared to do that or not? That's another question. So, Anna, please go, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, I mean, and I think that's a good point because uh, I, I often, I've been to Leipzig as well, uh, and I, I really enjoyed being part of the city. And I also sometimes come to our Asian counterparts, uh, sometimes just to kind of say that this is our neighborhood, you know, can we, can we learn from our, our, our neighborhood as well. And, um, and so rail-based uh, cities, if you will, uh, like Hong Kong, like Singapore, have extensive bus-based systems, right? And and I think if we have to take, um, I think if I'm not mistaken, the master, uh, the baseline study said that we are roughly around uh, between 25 to 30 buses per uh, million population, whereas the whereas global norms would say 60 to 70. That means we need anywhere between 18,000 to 21,000 buses um, by 2041, right? So what we- And the, and the present fleet is, uh, I think, I mean, it's further reduced. I mean, not more than 5,000 earlier, but I think it's further reduced, yeah. Yes, and um, I think uh, the entire fleet is more than 10 years old. So I think uh, this is unfortunate. Um, I, would, I will say that the transport department is trying to, uh, uh, improve the bus fleet. I will not. I will not say that they are not. But the master plan document needs to have this vision, right? Um, uh, for improving uh, bus based travel. And so, some of our big recommendations around this was that, um, which looked uh, at an overall mobility scenario, was that ninety percent. And I'll also come to the share of. 80, 20, I don't know where these come from. It was there in the previous master plan as well, not implemented. But we said that at least 90% of all trips in Delhi should be by walk, cycle, integrated public transport. We need bold action. There can be nothing else, right? And we also said that 90% of residents in Delhi should be able to access frequent bus-based transport system within five minutes walking distance because they, because we are not going to be able to get that kind of connectivity uh, with the metro rail system. The, just the, the third piece that we were also talking about is that all new housing, especially affordable and EWS housing should again be within five minutes of frequent uh, bus-based transport and why and because of you know I mentioned this the issue of income and affordability it's insufficient to say frequent public transport because even if they live close to a metro station will they be able to afford it and that's why we said uh, within five minutes walking distance of bus-based transport um, I think we also recommended that the corridors right uh, that have high frequency of service uh, if you, I can give you some numbers, but high, they're called super trunk corridors as per the transport department, um, inner ring road, outer ring road, some of the, some of the, uh, uh, the existing metro rail corridors as well. We need to improve travel times for, for buses along these corridors. Now, what, how do, how we do it is up to us. Increase parking fees significantly. 
right? So that, that people on these uh, frequent service corridors are disincentivized to, to uh, visit these destinations along these. I forgot to mention one thing, Jitendra, because we, when, when we actually compared, so I only spoke about bus and metro, and I forgot, and paratransit, I forgot two wheelers, right? Because a majority, I think, a majority of the personal motor vehicles are two wheelers. If I have to use my two wheeler uh, in, in, in Delhi, and if I account for fuel cost, if I account for parking costs currently, um, it's actually more affordable for me to use my two wheeler than to travel. Uh, by the phase two metro stations with first and last mile coming. So it's like just pause, right? It is cheaper for me to use a personal mode of transport. So how are we ever going to achieve this 80-20 uh, mode split? And therefore we will have to very, uh, we have to think about uh, parking, parking management, uh, and political will for that in a very serious way. The master plan does have some good provisions. We just have to see how it gets implemented um, on those lines as well. Uh, just, yeah, any, the third piece that I wanted to talk about was paratransit. It's not sufficiently addressed. Um, and there were two big things that we wanted to speak about here. We need to organize our paratransit systems so that one, we can achieve fair integration between bus, metro, and our shared um, auto rickshaws and other, other vehicles as well. This is difficult, it's not easy, but, but it will require that. So currently, let me give you an example. Um, if we have a Grameen Seva, each operator will be assigned a route, but they compete with each other. And so there are different ways that we will need to think about in terms of uh, organizing paratransit operators and thinking about um, either corridor-based uh, uh, franchises or zone-based franchises and all that so, that, so that we are also able to think about fair integration. What I wanted to say is that the, the master plan talks about public transport accessibility levels and says that areas that have poor public transport connectivity can have higher parking norms. This is, this is I think, um, inappropriate because areas that have poor public transport connectivity in general, but are, are, are also overlapped with many lower income neighborhoods. Uh, when we are looking at areas of Parvana, areas of uh, Sangar Bihar, we are looking at Najakar and beyond. We are talking about uh, 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 Jahangir Puri, Raghubir Nagar. So to me, I think that this cannot apply. Right? And, and, and I think that we're putting the burden of travel on lower income populations, um, on, on them and their costs without providing public goods. So I think I'm going to take that and then come to TOD if you would like. TOD happens to be one of the, you know, most uh, uh, pro pro propounded uh, word in, in, in the master plan. It was there in the 2021 also, hardly anything happened. And there is a fair amount of criticism also, you know, I mean, to what, to whom does the TOD cater? I mean, what about the, the the profile of the town. I mean, so, you know, the Delhi doesn't just exist amongst the middle classes. There's a whole lot of working people here. Yeah, please. Uh, I think there are multiple things to be said about TOD, but let me, let me summarize uh, just for everybody's benefit on what does transit-oriented development mean? Uh, it means that we want to encourage uh, the use of sustainable modes of transport, particularly uh, when we concentrate higher densities around uh, mass rapid transit systems. Now, let's look at our, um, our, our Juki Jokris. Let's look at urban villages. And let's look at the principles of TOD. What are the principles? First, Street connectivity, smaller urban block sizes so that you can walk. So it's nice to walk, your trip distances can be shorter. 
pedestrian or cycling infrastructure so that again you know you're encouraged to uh, walk or cycle three density of residents okay not only density of built up area and i think this is this is that balance of density between residents and built up area yeah amenities right so having tod doesn't mean you don't have amenities it means that we have high quality compact neighborhoods so your social amenities your public open spaces etc are part of of such neighborhoods five reduce reliance on personal motor vehicles so you do that through your parking lots right uh, so of course if i have uh, high parking uh, norms then i will use my personal uh, motor vehicle by you know because that will happen and so this is very critical critical we call it travel demand management so therefore you have to disincentivize personal look at an urban village for example we can take multiple examples but you know i go to kotla fairly often mark masjid etc it actually meets all the criteria that we have outlined here perhaps except except perhaps public open spaces amenities and and maybe good street design i mean we have to think about i mean there are ways to think about how we design shared streets but and this is important so therefore for for all settlements that lie within the tod influence zones don't need to do anything except upgrade with better amenities i mean if i yeah. i i see usdda i mean what do you, what do you think i mean I and mean, where do you exactly apply the tod in delhi yeah. so this uh, as per the uh, as per the master plan this would happen around your metro rail stations right um at the within about 5 to 800 meters of your metro rail stations the the and and for existing areas i have already suggested some ways in how we can think about affordability the second thing which i think is also interesting and should be explored is that tod current that for every 100 square meters of built up area you will have one parking space Do you also kind of indirectly address um, different affordability groups, right? Because I think there is a need also to think about the the low middle and the middle class as well, because there is a shortage of of housing for this segment too. Um, and what we need to do is have very bold action on parking lots. So let me give you an example from other cities. uh cities like paris don't require developers to provide any parking motorized park okay within 500 meters of public transport here we need to provide at least one car park for 100 square meters and i think we need to reduce that and make it optional to provide parking this what this will do is one that this will avoid transit adjacent development which means that people who will buy apartments close to transit you know who will want to use their personal cars right but then they will they will not be able to do that in no not a gandian at all but uh, okay so but but i think there's something which i really like about about uh, what gandian that is what you preach you must practice and that's what i used to do when i was the deputy mayor of simla i used to bike i mean bike i used to bicycle and you know there was an elevation of 500 meters in a distance of around the uh, 9 kilometers and that is kind of a uh, uh, environment that has to be built it's not just about about uh, you know raising those issues but it has to come it has to come collectively from and especially uh, 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 greater the power I mean, greater the responsibility so i think we must create uh, may perhaps some days or or some kind of i'm mean, just imagine your chief minister your lieutenant governor uh, going to the offices on bicycles or or i mean 
the kind of environment that it brings. And it's not that it's not happening. It's across the world it's happening. I, mean, if, uh, I, I can quote maybe half a dozen or maybe a dozen mayors and, and, and who are far larger than, 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 than Delhi who, who use public transport, actually, who commute on the bicycles. Else, it's completely unsustainable. This is something that that we, 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 I mean, this this is something that we've inherited, and this if we pass on to our children, it's it's a disaster. It's a catastrophe. So I think, thank you so much. But uh, how does the two forty one plan, and maybe some some, uh, uh, I mean, it's just all anecdotal experiences because uh, we, I remember the then chief minister when we were in office saying, you just prepare a plan because you know you have to create some innovative ideas. Why do you incentivize people to buy cars? Why, why can't you disincentivize people to buy cars and incentivize them to buy bicycles apart from creating those lanes? Or maybe in, maybe just pass on an increment to them. I and mean, this is what the chief minister had suggested. He said, you prepare a plan. And if the plan suggests that, okay, the person is buying a bicycle, moving to the office, uh, or, and of course you require a commensurate infrastructure to that. That's, that's a separate thing. Uh, so, is that we will create a provision in the budget to to provide some increment, you know? So increment is a big thing in India, you know? So, I mean, just imagine, I mean, getting an increment to ride on a bicycle to your office, what does it mean? Small, small things, I think. But I think we, and then the last part, uh, what again, it comes from, I think we require some dedicated bicycle officers who prepare plans, who run the city, and who, who just bring in that, and that's what this Delhi government has to think about. Not just the DD, the DD can't do it, I think. Maybe some bicycle, or just appoint some 500 bicycle officers and just see the change that you can. Yeah, so you're the last, yeah. you're the last one. Yeah, if I may, and I completely agree with you. You know, there are very interesting experiments, not experiments, interesting things to learn from. And if I may, if you look at London and if you look at the world, do you know what we have done? Under the main, they have now, created a, spe a special position at the leadership level of a NMT, uh, NMT commissioner or an NMT champion. What does this person do? I mean, and, and many cities in, in, in the UK have done that, right? This person's job is precisely this, is to become a role model for walking and cycling in their city. You know, because often we need coordination with so many people, traffic police, yes. utilities, this, and, and I think that's what we need, right? If, for example, PWD had a, a points uh, a bicycle leader who then becomes the face and the advocate at the leadership level, because once you have the leadership, then a lot of other things fall into place, you know? May I, if, if, you know, I just want to kind of end this with an interesting story of my own. So uh, my partner and I, we both work in sustainable transport and um, uh, we, we have between ourselves, we, we have one bicycle and we're planning to buy another, but we don't and do not want to own a personal motorway. So when we were looking for a, a, a new apartment two years ago, do you know how we got a present apartment? Because we didn't want parking space. I think our, our landowners, our, uh, our landlords said that, you know, I think they were struggling to find tenants, but we said, no, we don't want a parking space. That's how we got our apartment. Interesting. I think, thank you so much uh, for, for really bringing in that qualitative and quantitative aspect of uh, mobility and actually what is missing. Thank you. Thank you.